Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Welcome to the State of Carbon Tech. I'm coming to you live from the empty XPRIZE office. Don't tell anybody, but I've snuck in here uh, so that my kids don't interrupt me every five minutes uh, during this session. Jokes aside, though, it's great to be with you. Thank you for taking a couple moments to be with us this morning. If you caught our State of Carbon Tech Summit at the Canadian Consulate in New York City last year during Climate Week, welcome back. If this is the first time at the event, welcome to the 2020 virtual version. It's been an exciting climate week, a busy climate week, and of course it comes in the midst of a pretty incredible and crazy 2020. But nevertheless, climate change continues, our fight to innovate our way out of this problem, uh, both the equity, the technology, the policy, the finance, everything about it continues, and Carbon Tech is still front and center in the middle of that. What we've got lined up for you today are a great couple of presentations followed by a panel discussion. So we're gonna hear about some latest uh, news and insights from the Circular Carbon Network. We're going to hear about the Carbon to Value program from Greentown Labs and Urban Future Lab uh, from New York. And then we've got a panel of fantastic speakers to really chop it up and get into a bit of a conversation about what is the state of carbon tech now for this climate week and what does it look going forward? Um, I'll remind everyone that's joined us today to please uh, use the Q&A function if you've got questions That'll really kind of kick off in about 30 minutes when we get into the panel discussion. The session is starting now and is gonna wrap up in 90 minutes. So once, uh, once I get through just saying again, thank you for joining us and welcoming everyone, I'm going to take a moment to kick it over to Nicholas Eisenberger. Nicholas Eisenberger is from Pure Energy Partners, uh, XPRIZE's partner in standing up the Circular Carbon Network. If you haven't checked it out, have a look at circularcarbon.org. We've worked with a lot of organizations to bring together a lot of great data resources. And so now what I'd love to do is hand it over to Nicholas to walk us through a short presentation on what the latest with the organization and that project is, but also what are some of the insights that we're gaining for this carbon tech space as we think about this climate week and as we take it forward. So without uh, further ado, let me take it and hand it over to Nicholas. Nicholas, are you ready? If you are, go ahead and share screen. Hey, there you are. Please take it away, Nick. Thank you, Marcus, and welcome everyone. Uh, so glad you can join us, uh, particularly during these strange times, as Marcus said. I am not here in this lovely landscape. It's my COVID uh, escape uh, um, landscape, um, but here in Connecticut and um, glad uh, we can do these kinds of things, which can draw people from around the world in this, in this new climate week in these new times. Uh, as Marcus said, I wanted to take a, a few moments to just give you an update on the Circular Carbon Network and some of the research we've been doing to help tee up uh, the panel discussion today. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. And that work, Marcus? Okay, thank you, everyone. Terrific, let's dive right in. So the Circular Carbon Network uh, started in 2007 as a joint uh, effort between uh, XPRIZE and Pure Energy Partners. Uh, after standing up the Carbon XPRIZE, we understood that there were a lot of people around the world working on these issues, but they weren't connected. We felt that we could uh, advance the state of the art more quickly by forming a network and creating a self-aware community and starting to enrich the ecosystem. Where we thought we could bring the most value was really focusing on the commercial and capital dimensions. There's lots of organizations that are working on policy and technical dimensions, um, but we really want to dig in where we had the expertise and sort of the visibility around how do we dramatically accelerate investment and then deployment. Um, as we get started here, just to touch on those sometimes tricky issues of terminology, uh, which have been uh, challenging for our field for some time, and I don't think it's going to end immediately. Uh, we define circular carbon as essentially an umbrella term uh, encompassing both carbon tech and carbon removal. And uh, the idea is that um, technologies and solutions that are directly touching the carbon mo molecule and trying to cycle them into something um, that has some positive impact on climate change. So we can get into, uh, and there are certainly debates that should go on in terms of improving our use of terminology, particularly as we try to communicate with others, but that's how we define it. So I won't spend a lot of time on this because if you're joining us today, I presume that uh, you think this is important, but this is really important. There are a few things that are more important, at least in our view. Um, science tells us that we have to both reduce dramatically the amount of CO2 emissions we're putting into the air and remove CO2 from the air. 
at massive levels, hundreds of gigatons, if not thousands of gigatons over the coming decades. And in turn, those um, present potentially, as we'll talk about today, significant business opportunities um, and, uh, and human development opportunities as we transition from a fossil-based economy to a uh, using you know, recycled or cycled uh, CO2 in, in its place. As today, we're going to focus more on the carbon to the carbon tech, the carbon to value pathways, and there are many of them. We live on a carbon based planet. Uh, many of the things that we enjoy in society are based on carbon, and uh, you can see the list here um, and uh, and some evocative pictures. Uh, but we're surrounded by carbon. Uh, nature itself is really our our eco our ecosystems are all built on carbon. Um, there's no reason why we can't use human engineering to try to mimic that and take this waste or this excess we have and create value from it. And there are many ways to do that. In addition, as I mentioned, significant upside. Carbon 180 and many others have looked at the opportunities over time to uh, take carbon and put it into products that we value, uh, building materials, fuels, fertilizers, plastics, chemicals, et cetera. And uh, it's a very significant opportunity. They estimated up to $6 trillion in 2030 uh, is the total available market for those different uh, uh, channels. So lots of good news, lots of growing momentum. Uh, we certainly feel this increasing urgency. The climate science is clear. The climate impacts are unfortunately increasingly clear, whether you're talking about glaciers or massive storms. We were hit by what I call a Tornado, a combined hurricane and tornado just a few weeks ago on the East Coast. The West Coast of the United States has been hit terribly by the fires and uh, many places around the world are experiencing this. In, uh, in addition, we've all been shut in and see what the consequences are of avoiding uh, and not preparing for a crisis with this pandemic. So the urgency is there and that is driving momentum. We're seeing a lot more interest across all those areas on the right, but key challenges remain. Uh, first of all, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, science tells us we have a decade or more to really get a grip on uh, the climate issue and the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. We need a massive amount of capital. There are still perceptions. People are still confused about these issues. Uh, where should we uh, spend our time uh, in terms of addressing climate change and what are some of the better solutions? And then, of course, techno-economics. There are real issues that need to be addressed in terms of getting the solutions to work and getting them down at a cost that the market can bear. So there are a set of critical needs that need to be addressed uh, as soon as possible. We need to continue to uh, innovate. Uh, we need to ex dramatically accelerate scaling um, and, and the amount of capital going into the field and ultimately deployment. So to succeed at this endeavor, we, we essentially have to build an entire new ecosystem, um, not, not quite from scratch, but very, very quickly at really a historic scale. We've done this before with things like power plants at the end of the last century, or two centuries ago, um, aircraft manufacturing, automobile manufacturing. We have ramped up um, uh, in, in, in human history things at the scale that's required, but it's, it's very up there. So we've got to get our, we have a lot of work to do. So, CCN is really built on that uh, idea of how do we help this ecosystem come together and thrive. So these are uh, some of the um, key stakeholders that we're focused on uh, trying to bring together in a self-aware community. So what do we do? Uh, we build, uh, we try to convene people, bring them together. This is an example today of this event. We've done, I think this is the fourth or fifth Climate Week event we've done. We've done many other events. We participate in other people's events. We try to uh, help bring this conversation uh, in, into many places around the world and then provide real content and education um, to stakeholders about the state of the, the market and about the opportunities. And ultimately, we're trying to drive towards action. So we've built a set of uh, indexes, which I'm gonna talk to you about shortly, that um, try to really create visit, more visibility into uh, the trends uh, that each of these stakeholders are facing and, the, um, uh, and, and ultimately help them connect and collaborate um, and, and, and act more effectively. We're very pleased with the audience that we've been able to um, uh, grow here over the last couple of years. Um, we have uh, over 6,000 subscribers to our newsletter and approaching 800 members, uh, 500 uh, investor subscribers. 
uh, nicely distributed across our different stakeholder groups, as you can see there on the upper right. And um, uh, people are responding very uh, uh, strongly to the data we're putting out, you know, some real institutions asking and using our data on a regular basis. So we're very pleased that uh, we put, we're putting this effort in and it's seeming to have a, a positive impact in the real world. So I just want to take a moment before we dive into the data to quickly thank um, our sponsors and partners. First of all, XPRIZE uh, has been uh, uh, the primary sponsor from the beginning here, and also the New York Community Trust has been a stalwart supporter. Uh, and then all our partner, partners, some of whom are participating today, Pat and others. Um, and uh, uh, these, uh, the data that we bring you today, I'm going to tell you about, really wouldn't have been possible to aggregate without the help of collaborative, organ collaborative minded organizations who share our passion for trying to grow this ecosystem. So I really wanna thank all of them. And then of course our team, uh, you know, myself and my partner, Samir, uh, Marcus and Nikki, you know, we've been working at this day to day for several years now, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of what we've achieved, but I really wanna point out um, the, the, the tireless effort of my colleague, Edward Hill, who for the past two years has uh, been, you know, our primary data jockey and uh, is, is, is tremendously talented at that. And these indexes wouldn't have been possible without um, his help. And uh, um, I also want to thank uh, over the last six months, um, Zach, Grace, Axel and Ariana, who have, uh, as fellows or interns, really weighed in and helped us put the indexes together that I'm about to give you a quick brief uh, overview of. And uh, you know, in the in this in this strange times, I have only met one of them uh, just be ha because he happens to live in my town. Um, but we've been very effective and very. Um, it's been a, a great joy to work with all of you. So thank you so much. So let's dive into some of the data here. So I'm going to go in index by index uh, that we've built. The first one we started with was uh, the innovator landscape, and the reason that we did this is that we investors ourselves weren't really odd. It was the pool of uh, technology developers, solution providers that was out there working on carbon value and, and, and carbon removal. So we really tried to aggregate as much as we could. Uh, that to provide context for others, for investors to say, there's a there there, um, and you should get um, you should get in, as well as corporates, as well as talent looking for uh, entrepreneurial opportunities. And so um, this was uh, really focused on carbon tech, but we're now starting to expand to carbon removal. But you can see uh, we've got several hundred companies in, uh, across the world. And, you know, perfectly honest, uh, we're very, we're bound by North America. Um, that's our, you know, where we have the easiest reach. We have some good partners in Europe. And so we've been able to bolster there. We're definitely eager to expand uh, the richness of our data into Europe, sorry, into Asia, um, uh, the Middle East, South America, and other geographies. So we welcome uh, your input on that. So just, I'm gonna fly by here and just give a couple of tidbits and so we can get to the conversation. Uh, we are going to release a market report next month at Verge. I'll tell you about that at the end. And there'll be a lot more uh, data in that market report, but I just wanted to give a little bit of the flavor of a couple of things here. First of all, we're seeing a real increase in the amount of companies being formed in this space. You know, just, just year by year, a, a growing amount of companies. We haven't really been able to add 2020 data there yet, but we will soon. Um, so entrepreneurs are really entering this. They're, this is a increasingly active field. And I would say at least uh, at a gut level, we can feel that pace picking up even in 2020. The, the types of companies these are, the, the pathways that they're pursuing, uh, the kinds of products they're bringing to market, as well as the customers that they're serving are very diverse. So this just speaks to the customers. We have a lot of data on the different product path, uh, pathways, but not showing that here in the interest of time. But you can see here that there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the different customers that uh, these carbon value companies are serving. Uh, but of course, a, a strong focus on oil and gas and chemical industries, not surprising, we're dealing with molecules, uh, carbon molecules. Those are the companies and the industries that know how to deal with those molecules that have some of the most biggest issues with those molecules, but it is more diverse than that. So we found that interesting. Similarly, if you look at the capital dimension, um, there's a broad spectrum of, of, uh, of capital providers that have uh, invested in these firms. 
Um, so that was encouraging to, hear, to see. Um, and of course, there's a concentration uh, at the government, corporate, and angel level, which is not surprising for a relatively early stage ecosystem where you have, um, you know, governments with, look, you know, kind of getting over, uh, take risk forward on uh, technologies coming down the pike, strategics that see the real need to get engaged in this new area, and then angels who are often the most, uh, you know, individuals who have some capital who are willing to take a risk. So that's not surprising, but it does suggest that there's this institutional investor gap or, you know, there's still more room for institutional investors to get involved. Although, as you'll see, that is starting as we go over the capital index. So the, we also did a deal hub, not just so the, the, the innovator index is really uh, focused on trying to provide context and color uh, to the growing ecosystem of technology providers and innovators. The deal hub is to try to help, you know, as I said at the beginning, uh, facilitate real action, real investment, real connectivity between investors and uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, we've been tracking over 80 deals and close to half a billion dollars of deal value across both project and uh, uh, corporate equity. And of course, this is more focused on the kinds of criteria that are of interest to investors in terms of deal size, stage, et cetera. And so let me give you just a couple of um, tidbits here. There's definitely a wide variety of investment sizes that we're seeing. So, um, you know, investor, there is opportunity across different types of, um, of uh, if you check sizes, if you will, in this space. So a broad spectrum of opportunities for capital providers. Um, at the same time, we do see a, still a concentration at the seed and series A level, um, but it is growing um, at the series B and, and, and later rounds. Um, this compared to our data in 2019 is definitely seeing some maturation down the pipe. Uh, companies tell us that they're really seeking specific types of investors as they're thinking about growing their companies. And you can see that here. Uh, top of the list, of course, is corporate. And that's also reflects who some of the major providers of capital have been. Um, but there's a feeling, I think, that they, uh, the corporates can provide the technical and commercial uh, capacity to help them scale. Um, there's also a, a big interest in family offices, uh, a sense that they may have the ability to, uh, you know, may have some concern for climate and may have the ability to flexibly deploy capital in a way that institutional investors may not yet. Um, and then, of course, there are, is a growing interest in venture, where you, you get the benefits of having institutional disciplined investors. So what are the implications of this? We can argue different things, but for me, it suggests that there may be, uh, if, if, if some of these early investors are right, um, there may be a big opportunity for people to get in early um, to, to have big returns and big impact. So let's look at the investor landscape. We're tracking 122 firms um, uh, that are deploying capital uh, across all types, um, venture, private equity, project, um, uh, public, family office, et cetera, uh, across these companies and you know, close to $200 billion of assets under management. Of course, not all of that's going into this space, but a significant amount of it is. Uh, I think we're all aware that there's increasing interest in climate solutions across the investment landscape, but our focus here in our index is really to say who's interested and in active in circular carbon specifically. And our goal here is not just to facilitate that connectivity between investors and entrepreneurs that I talked about earlier, but also to help investors. Uh, if you think about uh, someone uh, trying to deploy capital, they really wanna know where the follow-on capital or the co-investors are gonna come from, or they may be uh, trying to think, contemplating putting together a fund in, in this space, um, but uh, uh, you know, wanna know uh, where the sources of capital for that might be, or people who wanna put capital into funds uh, who are the leading investors. So we're also really trying to address the investor audience here. Um, and um, we're really pleased with what we find, we're find we finding here. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of who are some of the most active investors, you can see the different types of institutions we're tracking here. And in the green bar, um, you know, both uh, the number of firms in that institutional bucket that have deployed capital. And so far we're seeing that VCs and angels are the most active investors in the circular carbon space and uh, private equity and, and venture have deployed the most capital in terms of raw dollars. In terms of the people that we're tracking or the institutions that we're tracking in the investor space, over 82% say carbon tech is a core focus or something that they currently consider. Um, uh, you know, words are somewhat 
uh, cheap, but we do see, as I just showed you on the previous slide, some real activity. But I was surprised by this. It's a very high percentage and very encouraging. And uh, over 70% say, they, say the same read carbon removal. I think carbon tech has got a little bit longer uh, tail in terms of where it's coming from. It's been around a little bit longer, but uh, carbon removal is, is up and coming and, and garnering significant interest as well. So uh, what are these investors interested in? Um, so some of the top focus areas you can see here, uh, really the, at the very top, you have carbon to value pathways around materials, chemicals, and polymers, and then also carbon capture from both existing sources and air. Um, that's, uh, you know, the, the, the direct air capture has, has been rising on the, on the radar. I have some interest in direct air capture, so just to, to be aware, but I, I, it's, it's, uh, it, it's encouraging to see that the, the, both the capture piece and the carbon of value piece are starting to, uh, to grow in interest. And interestingly, uh, enhanced oil recovery is not seen as something uh, as a, of great interest to uh, investors. Um, it's a controversial topic, um, and we'll see some more about that in the later data here. So just quickly going uh, into um, the corporate landscape now, I think we're all aware that the last um, couple of years have seen a dramatic increase in corporate announcements in this space. And we're track, we, what we've tried to do is sort of uh, put some numbers behind that. You can see a representative sample of some of the corporations that we're tracking here. They represent approximately a 10th of all global emissions and uh, a 10th of all uh, Fortune 500 revenue. And what we've tried to do is say where there are intersection points with a circular carbon across R&D investment project hosting, purchasing sales. We sort of seen these as the most substantial intersection points where they can help grow the sector. And so this is a sense of what we're seeing in terms of broad industry representation on the left and on the right, um, sort of the breakdown of uh, where they are um, intersecting. So R&D and investment are the top, and that's not surprising again, because we're still relatively early, although again, it's all maturing, um, but those would be natural places for corporations to start, but it is distributed. In terms of their focus areas, 73% uh, are focused on carbon capture and 30% on C, uh, carbon to value into fuels and chemicals, and then some of these other numbers. And finally, uh, in terms of their investment, so that was R&D, in terms of their investment, we talked a little bit about general investors. Here's what corporate investors are, are, are really focused on. Uh, first and foremost, capture, uh, and then carbon to value again. And then again, not EOR, which is a little bit more surprising. Finally, in the capitalist, uh, sorry, the catalyst landscape, just a quick preview here. The catalysts are organizations that are really essential to the growth of any emerging market. They're the supporting organizations, they're the accelerators, the service providers, the NGOs, all the different types of people that uh, really help a, a market mature uh, and provide the services they need. And so uh, we have, uh, we're tracking uh, uh, these in, uh, types of organizations in our index, the Catalyst Index, and for the moment is dominated by NGOs and convening orgs like CCN and Climate Week, but you're starting to see commercial service providers and project developers enter as well. And these are some of the major uh, core activities they're bringing to the table. Um, so you, you, it does suggest that this ecosystem is growing and maturing. There's a richness there that we didn't see just a couple years ago. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. This is just a little uh, 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 insight into uh, the specific focus areas of these organizations. But the idea is we're trying to help use this index to, to match people in the industry who need services with those who have the capability and the passion around those services. So I hope this has been helpful to give you a sense of flavor and, and, and some uh, inspiration for our discussion. Um, how can you get engaged? Well, first, send us your data. We're always eager to, to, to uh, take in more data so we can enrich in this, uh, this landscape, which we do share on our website. Join CCN, it's free. We'd love to have you part of our network. Partner with us. Um, we'd love to work with you in more, uh, more intense and integrated ways. Um, we're working on our programming coming up. We've got a lot of uh, uh, resources we need to uh, source and deploy to help continue to grow this field. And as I mentioned at the beginning, We'd love you to join us, uh, continue the conversation at Verge next month. We'll be releasing the market report on all this data. So stay tuned on that. So thanks very much and uh, look forward to the rest of this conversation. I'll throw it back to Marcus. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, it's, nice, it's a nice problem to have, to have a bit too much data to be able to share. So that's another reminder to everybody, look out for the report that's got the full um, complement of data and analysis. Uh, there was one great question in, in the Q&A. I think the answer is going to be in the forthcoming report. We'll see if we have an interim answer. 
Uh, in a moment, I'm going to throw the, uh, I don't know what to call it, the control over to Pat Sappensley. But before I do, I'd love to engage the audience in a really quick poll. So I'll ask Caden to put up our poll question. Um, and I'll let Pat know that you're on about one minute standby. Uh, this is just a, a way to give us a sense of the audience and we'll be sure to um, share these results back. We're gonna give everyone about another 20 seconds or so. So give this a quick click. How would you describe your current professional focus on circular carbon issues? We've got a couple of other, the, of a, other of these questions that we'll sprinkle through the session, um, probably at the transitions to give us a bit of time to digest this. But uh, we always appreciate your feedback and also uh, want to pick your brains a little bit later with a couple of other questions. As you finish up your vote, uh, I'll prepare to hand over to Pat. Pat's going to tell us a little bit about a really exciting carbon to value program that she and others uh, are putting together. This is a great opportunity for Innovators, it's a great opportunity for corporates looking to get into this space or to accelerate their participation. Um, before I do, I'll just point out, uh, I think everyone can see this, but it looks like we've got, what, 60%, about two thirds of people are telling us that circular carbon issues are their core focus or a core focus. Um, and then we have a lot of other people that are working on it as, a, as a, one of many other focus areas. So that's great, appreciate that, pull functions working. With that, I would love to hand over to Pat, invite you to uh, turn on your video, uh, share your screen, and take us through some of the highlights of the new exciting program that you are behind. Over to you, Pat. Terrific. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thanks for, set can you hear me? Yeah, terrific. Um, thank you for setting us up with all that great information, Nicholas. It is wonderful to see the momentum that has occurred in this industry in the last couple of years, especially since last year's summit. Um, let me try now to share my screen. I'm going to turn off my video because my bandwidth is so limited that if I try to do both, we'll have a problem. So this was up a minute ago. Of course, it's not up now. There you go. Okay, can you all see that? I hope that's a yes, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Pat. I can't quite see your slides. All right, let's see what's happening here. I see them. Better? Looks good, you're all good. Okay, thank you. It wouldn't be a Zoom call without someone having a little trouble. Um, all right, as I said, thank you so much uh, to, for inviting us to participate on this uh, call. It's wonderful to see the progress that's been made. I'm delighted to uh, talk to people about the Carbon to Value Initiative. Uh, this is going to be a program run by the Urban Future Lab, of which I am head. The Urban Future Lab is at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. We're a center that has 10 years of experience and using entrepreneurship as a tool to combat climate change. So we've helped about 70 companies to scale up. 90% of them are still up and running. They've raised hundreds of millions of dollars and created hundreds of jobs. Um, and and I, I like to think that we are a big part of the engine that is building the New York clean economy. Uh, for this program, we are partnering with, let's just see if this will progress. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, for the CTV initiative, we've collaborated with a spectacular group of partners. You can see them here um, to drive the creation of a new and thriving carbon tech ecosystem. We hope to do nothing short than contribute to the creation of a new industry. Um, Nicholas gave you some of the numbers. There's a $6 trillion market opportunity. Um, and, and we define carbon tech quite broadly it includes both the capture and conversion of carbon dioxide into valuable end products, as well as business model innovation needed to drive the market. In order to drive the market, we need very capable partners. We have two state agencies working with us, NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research Development Authority, who has made this an important part of the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act of, of Governor Cuomo's 
and of course our partners at the Consulate General of Canada and New York who have been very uh, involved in this sector since the start and, and hosted actually the summit last year. Um, you just heard a little bit about what we do at the Urban Future Lab. Our other partners here are the really excellent Greentown Labs and Fraunhofer USA Institute, both out of Massachusetts. We have partnered with them in the past. We have great success working with them. I'd say more than two thirds of the young companies that we've uh, worked on with them together have walked away from our accelerators with corporate partnerships or some kind of channel to market partnership. So this multi stakeholder best in class consortium will help to rapidly commercialize and scale up carbon tech innovation. And, and in everything we do, we try very hard to build strong collaborations. I'm sure we've done that here. So our process is going to be that you should look for in October, a call for entries. Uh, the RFP will go out in October. And then we, we pull in these companies. There's an in-depth technical analysis led by Fraunhofer, which is a group of scientists. These are the scientists who helped uh, uh, two decades ago to commercialize solar in Germany. So we know we have the right partners here. And we will down select from the global entries that come in. We'll select eight to 10 companies to work with. And then we're going to de-risk those companies by providing them mentorship, training, workshops, um, preparation for work with the corporates. This will be a dedicated work of corporates that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, our experience with, with these partners in the past has proven our methodology. Um, you know, in fact, recently announced at Climate Week yesterday or the day before, uh, the Department of Buildings in New York City announced that they would be collaborating with four startups in New York on building energy efficiency, and three of the four were our companies. So that tells you a little bit about the quality of our work. Um, the, the most important part, of course, will be the collaboration with the corporates who will be on what we're going to call the Carbon Tech Leadership Council. Deployment is everything, and those, those corporates will help with deployment. Um, so how do we do it? There will be three, uh, three years of accelerator programs, one each year. Each accelerator will run intensively for six months, and then of course we will continue to work with them as we move on to the next group. Uh, there will be a tailored, customized program to help startups bridge the gap between their technology and the market. You know, very often, I've worked with a lot of engineers and scientists in the past. Very often, they're quite far from the market. They don't have the market knowledge they need. By pairing them with the corporates, they will get that market intelligence and it will help them to succeed. And we're going to cast the net widely. This multi-technology focus means that we don't, certainly at the beginning of the program, know everything that's out there and everything that will work. We want to see and observe everything that will work. We want to try to find the right corporates to work with everything from advanced materials and chemicals to the agriculture sector, energy, you know, the natural resources. So deployment help is critical. So we'll find the companies and we'll pair them with corporates and that will help them to get ahead. Um, they'll have access to industry and technology relevant expertise and knowledge based on the best carbon tech thought leaders. These will be people coming from academic institutions and some of the NGOs here today. I'm not ready to announce anything yet, but uh, who, who the members are of the Carbon, Leader, uh, Carbon Tech Leadership Council. But it will be the best of the NGOs, the best of the academics, and the most important big multinational corporations in those areas I mentioned. Um, together, we'll be able to boost deployment because that is what will make these companies successful. So the Carbon Tech Leadership Council um, will be top executives. It will be invitation only. We will invite some now and we will invite some as we find the startups that we wish to provide with corporate help. So this is an ongoing process. Um, the startups will have the opportunity to hear firsthand from the CLC members about their carbon tech strategies about what it is they need, what the gaps are, um, what 
what the market needs and what they're looking for and why they're looking for these things. I'm sure we'll talk about the why of it a little bit later in the conversation. Um, I think the CLC members will benefit from participation because they will be able to supplement their own R&D. They can't do R&D on everything. They'll be able to supplement their own R&D with the best of class startups. They'll get the opportunity to work with New York State and with Canada. They'll get the opportunity to collaborate elbow to elbow at the quarterly meetings with the top NGOs and the top academics in the field. So this will have value for everyone and help our companies to scale up. So here's the website, c2vinitiative.com. On the website, we now have a form you can fill out if you're a startup and you're interested in knowing when the RFP goes out, please fill that out. Um, if you're a corporate that's interested in joining us, please make that known too. There's another form for corporates. Uh, there's lots to read about the initiative there and we would be delighted to have you join us. So thank you, Marcus, over to you. I'm gonna stop the share here. Fantastic, thank you so much, Pat. Um, exciting new initiative for innovators, for corporates, for others, stay tuned for that. Uh, panel, you are on deck. David, uh, Purv, Pat, we're gonna hear from you again, and Rio. Before we do, uh, let's pop up another uh, question. Caden, if you've got it ready, drop it. Um, we'd love your feedback again, folks, through a poll. We'll do the same thing we did last time. We'll flash it up on the screen, give you about 30 seconds to think on it um, and report back. A year from now, do you anticipate that you will spend more or less time on circular carbon issues? Okay, give you a couple more seconds to answer that. More time, look at that, we're growing. I think we're biased in this audience, but also it's good to hear uh, that most folks see that they might be spending more time. I think that's great because it's clear the space is growing, but also it takes really, I think, individuals, the people that have joined this call and many others uh, like us to really take it forward. So that's great to hear. Alrighty, I'm excited to get into a bit more discursive part of the, the uh, program today. I'm gonna to invite Apur of Sinha, David Alenowitz, uh, Rio Okumura, and Pat Sappensley to come back, turn on your videos, unmute yourselves. These are folks that represent a broad spectrum of this space. The entrepreneur, investors, corporates, uh, catalyst organizations, they all come from a different perspective. They've all got deep experience and expertise, um, and I think creativity in this space, uh, and they've all got a slightly different angle on it. So uh, I'm going to really focus uh, the rest of the time on getting them to uh, tell us inspiring and creative and thoughtful things. But before I do, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. David, I will start with you and ask you to please introduce yourself, um, tell us how you came to the space and uh, briefly what you're up to. Great, thank you, Marcus. Um, I spent uh, 25 years in private equity where I invested in scaled companies from the tens of millions, the hundreds of millions of dollars. And then about two years ago, I decided to shift 100% to climate change, uh, originally as a philanthropist. And then after a few months, after seeing the IPCC report talking about the absolute need for carbon dioxide removal, I decided to uh, shift gears, focus on the technology side, and eventually set up a new entity called Zero Carbon Partners, uh, in which I invested just my own capital and looked to invest in and scale companies low carbon space. Uh, I've made uh, five investments to date. Uh, the most relevant for this area is one in Solidia, uh, one of the leading CO2 to concrete companies, um, where I actually just this past week, we closed a $75 million capital round that I led. So that was kind of exciting news in the CO2 to concrete space. I'm also a senior advisor to Global Thermostat, one of the world's three uh, direct art capture companies, um, and uh, part-time advisor to XPRIZE for the carbon dioxide removal prize. So, um, but very excited to be here and certainly looking forward to seeing what we can all do to further you know, scale up the, uh, the CO2 removal and uh, CO2 utilization spaces. Thanks so much, David. Uh, Rio, maybe I'll go to you next and then Apur, then Pat. Rio, please introduce yourself. Marcus, hi. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, uh, my name is Rio. Uh, I'm working in Mitsubishi Corporation Silicon Valley office. I'm based in Palo Alto, North California. But Mitsubishi is, uh, is doing very much anything. Uh, we have 10 business verticals, including natural gas, petroleum, mining, 
uh, infrastructure, power, consumer, blah, blah, blah. So uh, we, we are kind of conglomerate. And myself, my background is oil and gas, natural gas, which you may hate. So uh, but actually I completely shifted to climate change type of business. So uh, in, under Mitsubishi Corporation, we have recently announced three CCU programs, uh, two mineralization concrete blocks. Uh, we very recently in this week, we have announced a partnership with Blue Planet, which is a startup company in Silicon Valley. Uh, they are making CO2 aggregate. And uh, Suikom, which is Japanese technology, uh, uh, capturing CO2 into concrete blocks, a very similar technology. And other one is a synthetic uh, fabric, uh, more specifically CO2-based parasitizing uh, demonstration project in Japan. So Mitsubishi Corporation is very keen. Actually, the CCU is very versatile and cross-industry type of uh, uh, business. So uh, uh, by having our versatile business uh, capabilities, uh, we are keen to uh, contribute uh, to enhance this industry. Thank you. Thank you, Rio. Uh, Apur, over to you. Oh, you, yep. Yeah. That old Hi, time. everyone. You can hear me now, right? Excellent. Uh, my name is Apur Sinha. Uh, I'm still going with my COVID hairstyle, so I apologize for not looking as formal as the rest of the panel here. Um, for the company itself, yeah, Marcus, <laughs> Marcus can relate. Um, we're a six-year-old company. Uh, we just turned six about a month ago. Uh, and we're a Calgary-based carbon utilization firm that has been working on uh, converting carbon emissions into solid nanomaterials for use in construction, plastics, as well as a range of applications looking at uh, pharmaceuticals and energy storage. I did want to just very quickly show a little bit of state of carbon tech from our perspective. Uh, I'll try to share my screen here. Marcus, let me know if you can see it. Um, so the reason I wanted to share these couple of slides is just to show um, I guess what we have found to be a very hopeful kind of message and, and something that has kept us going pretty, pretty hectically through the summer. Um, what you see at the top of the screen here is a panorama image I took on my phone. This is our setup at the Alberta Carbon Convergent Tech Center where the uh, Canadian leg of the Carbon X Prize is happening. Uh, this is our eight ton a day reactor that you see in the middle of the screen and our 50 by 100 foot building that's actually housing that along with the drive train and a lot of the auxiliary carbon capture or carbon transport systems from the capture system that's uh, further back on the screen there. Uh, this picture is already outdated, um, but it does show the amount of progress that we've been able to make. Like this was literally untouched land as of five months ago. And we've been able to set up uh, this entire thing over what has really been an extremely taxing time with COVID and, and its repercussions both here in Alberta as well as elsewhere. And what we found fascinating in our journey through the Carbon X Prize is how much that has forced us to accelerate uh, since we actually started as a company. I mean, as a TRL one, uh, one company back in fall 2014, we were still dealing with small reactors that were the size of a small cookie jar. And in the first four years of our company's existence, that's really where we stayed because we're validating the technology at a very early stage of development. Uh, we were arguably only at TRL4 when the XPRIZE began back a few years ago. And just in the year and a half since the semifinals, we've been able to take on what is essentially an industrial operation. And the hope is that with the results that we're able to show here, uh, we're able to engage in a meaningful way with strategic companies like Mitsubishi and others uh, to show that we can not only reduce the carbon footprint of legacy industries such as construction, uh, plastics and others, which we think are going to be a big part of our future moving forward, uh, but also reduce carbon emissions from the atmosphere as a result. And I just wanted to finish by saying uh, what has also been exciting for us, and, and there are many examples of companies uh, through 2020 that have been able to make a real splash in the field. From our perspective, taking a novel material, getting it through the regulatory hoops in North America, as well as actually doing commercial deployments where there is a greenhouse in Alberta now and two projects around uh, electrical, you know, commercial developments where our concrete with lower carbon emissions has actually been put into the ground uh, and been paid for by a client. We've seen those as extremely uh, good silver linings for what has otherwise been a tough period. And it keeps us pretty optimistic about the decade 
uh, that's to come. Great, thanks Apoor. Um, exciting to see more pics from your setup in Calgary. Um, hoping to get to actually see that in person uh, if I can uh, figure out how to get into the country. Uh, okay, uh, Pat, uh, I think we know you, but if there's anything else you'd love to add, um, please go for it. And I've also got a question from the audience for you, but over to you, Pat. Okay, let me very quickly tell you a little bit more about UFL. Um, we are part of NYU Tendon School of Engineering. We're funded largely by NYSERDA. We run four programs. The largest is the Acre Incubator, which I mentioned that has scaled up those 70 companies over 10 years. But we run smaller accelerators. The H2 Refuel Accelerator was one we ran last year and will run again next year. Uh, it was based on the success of scaling up green hydrogen with Fraunhofer and Greentown that we came up with this program. So it's tried and true. We've done it before. It was a huge success. We also run an educational program. We are part of an educational institution where we take in career changers who want to enter the clean economy. So if you're in New York and you're, actually everything's virtual now, you could be anywhere. But if you're you know, an account, accountant, lawyer, architect, and you wanna learn more about how to enter the clean economy, we give courses every semester uh, that teach people about building energy efficiency, project finance, utilities, how energy is traded, and people graduate after a capstone project and some coursework with a certificate in clean energy from NYU. So that's very helpful as people are trying to change careers and come into this industry. I think that's all I might wanna say. What's your question for me, Marcus? Okay, it's I'm channeling Ben Altman who asks, what kind of technologies are allowed, I think, in the carbon to value program? What's the scope, carbon drawdown or capture? So we are aiming for all of these in the first year. I know it sounds like an enormous amount to bite off, but as we're learning, we don't want to close the door on anything. Um, I think carbon capture, carbon utilization, natural solutions, and then we will bring in a corporate who can help you. So we want all of those. And above all, and I think we'll talk about this more, I'm curious as to business model innovation there will be business model innovations that drive this sector the same way the power purchase uh, agreements and yield codes drove solar and made them deployable and prevalent and brought the cost down. And, and right now we're gonna need some business model innovation in order to provide value here. So we're looking for all of it. And, and we, we will you know, select down from the hundreds of entries we get but please, if you have something, send it to us. We are looking for, you know, TRL4. Of course, that's not applicable in something like business model innovation, but in the tech, technology companies, we're looking for something that's, you know, already got a little bit, a little bit of a tested project going. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, Pat. Sure. Now, we've got about another 40 minutes uh, of these folks' time. I'm going to pepper them with as many questions as I possibly can think of, but this is also an invitation to the audience to please get your questions for our panel using the Q&A chat function. Um, uh, fire them in and we will get to as many of them as we can. There is one more pointed question for you, David. This came in a couple moments ago. This is from uh, Menashe Zelika. I apologize if I didn't get that name right. What is the investment focus? Do you invest in non-US companies, a particular stage, or uh, do you have a defined average check size? Um, so in terms of uh, size, uh, most investments are between 250,000 and 2.5 million. Uh, stage is uh, very variable. I just uh, did this Lydia deal, as I mentioned, which is very late stage. I also actually started up a company, so that's pretty early stage and anything in between. Uh, the focus is really on businesses that are deemed to have a, a good chance of materially impacting climate change, meaning uh, I define that as a 0.5 to 1.0 gigaton per year impact on CO2 or greater. Um, and so obviously it has to be a, uh, a, a business that is material going to impact uh, CO2 levels and also be scalable on a, on a you know, significant scale. Okay, terrific. Thanks for that. All right. Um, the first topic I'd love to engage the panel on is, well, it's climate week. And you've probably noticed it's sort of raining net zero commitments. Companies are making commitments, national governments are making commitments, subnationals, even other organizations. Um, I'm curious what you think this means for this sector. That's a fairly broad question. I guess I'll narrow it to 
do you think carbon tech and circular carbon will play a strong part in that or a peripheral part? What do you think those announcements mean for this sector? Uh, volunteer if you'd love to go first or I'll call on someone. I'm happy to go first. So um, yeah, I think it's gonna have a pretty big impact. And I, and I know personally, because I've had already been engaged by several of the large corporates on this exact topic where they say that uh, they've got a commitment to reducing their uh, carbon footprint and they wanna put money out to that effect. So it could be, I think the primary focus at the moment is carbon dioxide removal so that they can specifically point to some level of carbon dioxide removal, but also CO2 utilization is something that they're open to. So it's early days for a lot of these big corporates that have made these announcements, but they're all trying to move quickly. There are more and more corporates that, that join all the time. And I think it's gonna have a transformative impact on, on the overall area because prior to this, you know, those of us in the business uh, or looking to build a business had to find a way to, to meet you know, market price. And here's an opportunity where we got corporates who say, oh, I don't care if you're at the market price, we'll give additional capital to doing it. So I think it's uh, got a potentially huge impact. Thank you. Any other comments on that? Of course, uh, as a large intercorporate, uh, we are very, very serious about uh, this kind of announcement. Actually, uh, Mitsubishi Corporation uh, haven't announced net zero yet, but uh, we are very keen. Actually, the issue uh, for uh, net zero announcement is scope one, scope two, okay, but scope three. So, so we are selling hydrocarbon still because uh, that's our business. So uh, to think about scope three, it's very tough. So I think uh, 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 it's great, scope three has great impact on the environment, of course. But having said so, uh, usually uh, people don't know about scope one, scope two, scope three. So I think uh, uh, it's very important topic. So I think, uh, 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 the people, uh, investors, uh, uh, has to, institutional investors, has to understand what is scope one, scope two, scope three, and I, I think it's uh, uh, it's very because it's important. So uh, I think a clear distinction uh, we need to have, and uh, and of course scope one, scope two. I think most of large corporation have to announce that zero. Okay, thanks for that, Rio. We will uh, keep our eye out for any announcements that might be coming from Mitsubishi uh, in the future. Um, I'll look at one piece there, Marcus. Uh, yeah. From a startup perspective, I think what has been interesting to see, especially with some of the, the news that's been coming around from Europe and even other jurisdictions about stimulating the economy post-COVID, um, I think there has been a lot of notion about uh, using clean tech and, and the renewable sector and, and essentially clean technology as a way of, of restarting the economy. And I think from a startup standpoint, I think David made an excellent point about companies like Solidia and others that have kind of established themselves in the field over a period of time. But I think as a company that is just beginning to enter, enter the commercial sphere, um, we're, we're realizing that the onus is now on the entrepreneur to really accelerate the pace so that we can catch this wave and, and use this as a way of, of getting into the market in a meaningful way. Um, so I think in, in a way, it's an exciting opportunity. I know having talked to a few other startups that are less than, you know, seven or eight years old, that they're seeing the same opportunity and, and it's exciting and nerve wracking at the same time, because there are going to be a lot of changes that are going to enable potentially uh, government procurement strategies, private, uh, you know, private companies to change their behaviors in the short term. And I think for, for entrepreneurs like myself and others, I think the challenge is to be able to really make sure that we have a tangible path to be able to leverage that, that scheme or that, that wave that we're seeing. Terrific, thank you. Um, all right, I'd love to stay on this theme a little bit and zero in on the topic of offsets. Uh, Rio, you brought up scope one, scope two, scope three. I'm getting the feeling that a lot of the scope three reliance is coming through offsets. So in other words, behind a claim that says we're gonna be carbon or net zero by, I don't know, 2060, 50, 40, whatever. Um, if you dig deep, the, the answer is, we're gonna do some carbon tech or something in the future and we'll use some offsets. And I think we all know that the offset game can be pretty murky. So I'm curious of the panel's thoughts about how you think the carbon tech and circular carbon community can become part of the offset conversation or do you see it another way? Is it something to be a bit careful with 
because frankly, we've been burned by offsets before. And I think there's still a lot of suspicion about do they work? How do they work? What types? I'm curious your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, actually, to capture CO2 is very costly. But actually, to offset the, by, by buying carbon credit, very cheap. So I think just to capture CO2, you have to pay maybe uh, 40, 50, 60, or sometimes 100 dollars per ton of CO2. But actually, if you wish to offset, you just pay three, five, that's okay. So uh, I think the carbon tax is very important uh, in this context. Because uh, uh, the issue is not scope, scope one, scope two. I think the issue is scope three. So why the large corporation is keen to contribute, support uh, entrepreneurs or start tech, uh, startup technology companies? Because it's a scope three carbon reduction. So I think uh, if you think about scope three uh, emission liability, I think why don't you think about scope three reduction uh, benefit? So. Uh, to, for large corporations to, to support, contribute startup companies or uh, emerging technology, emerging carbon tech is kind of scope th very much scope three thinking. So I think uh, uh, under current uh, offsetting scheme, it's very tough to think about scope three reduction. But uh, I think uh, uh, we, we need to go beyond uh, the current uh, legitimate carbon offsetting uh, scheme. And, and I, I would just add to that, uh, Marcus, that I, I, you know, I'm finding that a lot of the corporates who have recently made announcements are very interested in the carbon tech space. I think they recognize the issues and offsets that there's some uncertainty as to what's the real value you're getting, what's the sustainability. And the advantage in carbon tech is that it's much more measurable. I mean, if you get, capture a ton of carbon, you know you capture a ton of carbon. If you, if you use a ton of carbon or several tons of carbon in utilization, you can measure that and clearly define it. So I think, uh, you know, many of the large corporates are saying, you know, yes, it'll cost more money per ton, so to speak, but they're willing to do it because they've got certainty. And also they feel it's really enabling a very important set of industries. So, so I think that that's been a nice uh, element of what's happening. And more and more uh, of these corporates are talking about things like carbon dioxide removal, which by definition, particularly if you talk about direct or capture, is, uh, is relatively expensive, but there's a real commitment to pursuing it. Any other thoughts on this? Okay, I'll take it a little bit further and ask, uh, I just wanna lean into the sort of the, let's say the public perception of offset. So I think it was a few days ago, or maybe last week, Google made an announcement. And I think the announcement was, our emissions are zero now. You welcome everyone. Surprise, our emissions are over. We've, we've zeroed them out. And I read a, a piece on Medium, and I, I apologize, I forget the off. It was basically a, a rip of that announcement saying, this is meaningless because it relies on offsets, and offsets are fake. Um, this is a real perception challenge that I think the broader industry will face and this sector will face. I'm curious if the panel have any thoughts on how you would address that kind of comment or that kind of feeling, because I think it is out there. Uh, Well, I mean, I, I think that the point is there really does need to be a higher level of integrity brought to the entire process of measuring, you know, what really counts and what doesn't. And I think that, you know, there are instances where some of the so-called offsets aren't really what you think you're getting. At the other hand, uh, there are plenty that are perfectly legitimate. So, you know, those comments they're making are, are unfair in some ways, but fair in other ways. And, and ideally, you would have some sort of independent body or something established that I think uh, was like a good housekeeping seal of approval that said, okay, this is truly something, this is truly measured. And hopefully, you know, governments or other policymakers will establish some sort of organization so that it can, it can clarify exactly what counts and, you know, level set the entire area. Yeah, I think I have one thought on that as well, Marcus, which is, I think more, uh, I guess it builds upon the point that David just made about the implications that this may have for carbon utilization. And I think, you know, a couple of years ago with the Global CO2 Initiative, there was an effort, and I know it's still going on within the X Prize with the University of Calgary, around baselining different technologies and creating a standardized way of looking at what are the, the direct and the indirect carbon emission reductions associated with certain tech. Um, I still think that in many ways, CCU is still the Wild West in that regard. 
Um, and a lot of the claims are not, you know, apples to apples comparisons. And I think, you know, especially with the ethanol industry, I mean, there, there isn't a month that goes by where you don't see another claim about the LCA of bioethanol not looking as great as it did back, you know, eight or nine years ago. And I think there is a risk that needs to be addressed from that, from that standpoint for our industry. Um, and, and even some of the criticism that people have of direct air capture and things like that, I think to David's point, some of those are valid concerns and criticisms and others are not. And I think being able to look at them transparently and having an academic component to that to make sure that the analysis is done objectively and, and in a way that can be conveyed to the mass audience so that you know it's a relatable message that can be digested. I think that's, that's definitely a, a need um, that is going to need to be um, addressed before this becomes a mainstream policy discussion. So I think this is a very immature market. You know, it, it brings up ideas, images in my mind of, you know, the commodities trading market in Chicago in 1920 and people bidding on corn without real uh, data behind them. And I think what we're seeing now is that there are many different methodologies for measuring. There's a lot of inconsistency. There are different markets in different places of the world. And as this market matures, hopefully some of the young carbon tech companies will be companies that measure with real transparency um, across various geographies in a way that this is made more uniform and becomes the norm. And I, I also think a lot of what people are doing now with voluntary mechanism is also a dress rehearsal for the next government, presumably in the United States, that might have a proper policy. Um, so there's a lot that's going on voluntarily that's a little messy that might be regularized with real policy going forward and with some better technologies over the next, that will be developed over the next couple of years. Okay, thank you for that. A comment from the audience, anonymous attendee says, what if we sell offsets that are not about planting trees, but are based on setting up and operating carbon capture plants? Um, I think that's exactly what is being discussed right now, what the panelists are, are hitting at. Uh, for the record, no one should be against planting trees, uh, but I think the idea of sort of a verifiable data-backed, uh, clear providence of CO2-backed offsetting system would go a long way for everyone, no matter what type of offset you're using, uh, and it is definitely something I think we need in this space. Okay, I'd like to get to uh, a couple of other audience questions that take us away from just the offsets conversation and into uh, how does this actually work? What does a practical and realistic project look like? This is a comment Apoor brought up when the panel was chatting about this session yesterday. Uh, so there's a couple of questions here. Uh, this is a new sector, says Anonymous. Which industry would you think would naturally drive this in the future? Is it a chemical industry play? Is it an energy play or other? Uh, the second question is, I'll just do it to it at once. To what degree is access to capital um, an accelerant versus a headwind to scaling CCU technologies that we need? Is this a capital question or are there other and more pressing challenges to scaling these critical technologies? So the first question was, which sector drives this? Second question was, are we capital limited or are there other limits? So I guess um, for the second question, sorry, shall I? Go ahead, Pat. Uh, for the second question, you know, the only policy we have now is 45Q. And uh, policy will drive the market, uh, certainly in the short term, even more than investment dollars, I think. Uh, and the assessment that the Department of Energy made about 45Q made wonderful projections about numbers of jobs created, uh, numbers of dollars that would be uh, deployed. Uh, and, and I think we need additional policies that are coherent, that have these uh, transparent measurement data collection mechanisms that we just referred to. I think policy will be a huge driver and I think it's coming. David, you were gonna add? Yeah, so, so to that point, uh, I would add that, um, you know, policy is, is certainly very important. I mean, it's, it's not the only thing since you can have policy, but if you don't have the capital to take advantage of policy, you're sort of stuck. So, you know, you need that as well. I mean, on the policy front, one of the pluses is, you know, certainly the Department of Energy has stepped up 
you know, nicely over the last few months and issued uh, several FOA of funding opportunity announcements offering several millions of dollars for director capture or for uh, uh, point, uh, carbon capture combined with uh, CO2 utilization. So that helps, uh, you know, support uh, interesting projects. Um, in terms of your, your other question on industries, I mean, I think it's gonna be a range of industries. It's, it's really hard to handicap them. I mean, there are a lot of different industries that are important, CO2 to cement and concrete, chemicals, plastics, fuels. And I think it's really gonna be a function of what are the technologies that come down the pike? What are the companies that grow them? And how, you know, how great is, the, is their performance in terms of what they, they're gonna do? So I, I would say it's sort of all, all the above. And I think it's interesting to see which companies come out and what technologies and how far they're able to, to move in terms of growing what they're doing and impacting the, the CO2 equation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna add a follow-up question to that, which is uh, you mentioned multiple industries and I'm gonna ask Rio to comment on this one first. Do you think that the carbon tech space or the circular carbon space is at a point where it's still helpful to talk about multiple industries all together? chemicals, fuels, building products, food, advanced materials, et cetera? Or do you think eventually there will come a time where it's more beneficial to speak just about the building sector to building sector people and sort of have it sort of flip the, flip the script and speak that way? I'm asking you, Rio, because I know Mitsubishi has several business lines and you've got task force that crosses all of them. So I'm curious your thoughts. Is now the right time? Is it a time to later or is there just another way to think about this? Thank you for the question. Actually, so the multiple uh, approach is very, very important. So the building materials, yes. I think a carbon tech people know CO2 can be uh, captured in building materials, concrete blocks. Probably you know. But actually, the user of concrete block is uh, maybe the construction industry or uh, the people who is living in, who is using the building. So the architecture, construction company. So it's a building material industry is very much different from construction industry, very much different from architectures. So I think we have to be think about holistic, even, and even for this mineralization, CO2 mineralization technology, you have to be holistic. And CO2, uh, yeah, cement industry is uh, emitting CO2, but actually cement industry is not exactly the same as building material industry. So, uh, I think uh, we have to think about the whole value chain, maybe fabric, same. So the, uh, the material company is burning fuel oil to produce plastic, but actually the user is maybe fabric. So I, I think uh, uh, we have to be holistic. So, and, and one more thing is the hydrogen. So to think about synthetic fuel, synthetic fabric, you have to source hydrogen as well. So hydrogen is also very much different in, I think, industry. So uh, to think about this kind of complexity, this is very complex new supply chain. Uh, we have to think about CO, where is CO2, where is, where is hydrogen, where the user of fabric, where the user of a concrete block. So uh, it's very versatile. So that's why it's, I, I always say this is not competition. Uh, this, is, this is a collaboration. So we have to collaborate with many industry entrepreneurs, uh, uh, many sectors. So that's very important, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Apoor, are you gonna comment on this? I just wanted to tackle this, the second question. I think uh, Rio just made a really good point about the type of industries that would be involved in taking different segments of the sector forward. Uh, but I think uh, the question around what is required apart from financing is something that, that I do have a couple of thoughts on. And I think I would say a lot of it is about getting the right stakeholders together uh, for a project. I think ultimately, even for very advanced carbon tech uh, projects, you do need um, a corporate or strategic partner that has operating facilities uh, with a, a, a lower aversion for risk than maybe is the case for most industries that have been around you know with 30 or 40 year uh life periods for, for their facilities and i think especially in direct air capture i think with uh things like pat talked about with 45q you know companies like oxy and others have actually been able to take that step forward and say look like we're going to take that risk with major assets and hundreds of millions of dollars 
that is generally not the case for new technologies. You know, if you think about the construction space, really, apart from Solidia, there isn't another bet that a company like Lafarge has taken with that big of a um, of an investment. And so, I think setting more precedence for that, and I think. Again, it, it's uh, to the point that Rio made about collaboration. I think what, one of the things we're finding now is getting a strategic partner on board. Like if you can get one of the top 10 cement companies on board as a strategic partner, not just from a financial perspective, but from a technical standpoint to make sure you're taking the boxes from a regulatory perspective and, and you know, from a client perspective, that really goes a long way towards getting the whole supply chain engaged and, and enabled. So I think more so than project financing, it almost seems like, you know, especially in the last six or seven months, there have been a lot of questions from uh, companies that deal in project finance, like reaching out to, to companies and saying, can you put a project together where we can deploy 20 or 50 or 100 million dollars? And, and the challenge then becomes like, can you put all of the ecosystem together, you know, the different stakeholders to make that project come together with the type of risk that is purely financial and commercial and almost take it to the point where you know solar got to in 2006 and 7 where it, it's all about offtake and once you get that offtake you know you're you're off to the races and the project is going and i think that's kind of the the bridge uh, th that needs to be built over the next few years for for most uh, ccu tech okay so, thank you uh, go ahead Pat. has just articulated the exact reason for the carbon to value initiative this is the voice of a founder saying we can't go to market without a big corporate we aren't the market, they're the market. The only way to get to the market is to be paired with one of these giant corporates. And that's exactly what our program will do. So thank you, Arpur, for articulating exactly what a founder needs that we will hope to supply. Okay, fantastic. I promise that was not pre-planned. <laughs> no, um, and we I, will be applying to that too, Pat. So you and good. Uh, Arpur, I have a specific question for you. I think you've kind of answered it, but I'll put it to you anyway. It's from Aaron Bronfman. After that, I'd love to go to Jen Wagner from Carbon Cure. We're going to pull some technology magic and bring her into the conversation um, because I know, uh, well, you've probably read about them in the news recently, but I'd love to get Jen's perspective on the discussion uh, very briefly. So one more question for you, Apoor, from Aaron Bronfman. Over the last six years of your startup, have you found it difficult to connect two sources of capital like David? Have you noticed an uptick in investment interest in the space? Sorry, have you noticed an uptick in investment interest as the space has gained visibility over the last few years and months? Upwork. Yeah, so first off, I would put a shout out to David here. I think he is fairly unique in, in the type of connections he's got and, and also the kind of acumen. Like I've had the pleasure of talking to David a couple of times in the last year and, and he's very pointed with his questions and I think he knows exactly where corporations like Mitsubishi and others are coming from. So. I think one of the bets that we took on early, I guess, Aaron, is, is really trying to get the technical risk as de-risked as possible. And, and we're trying to do that in as lean a way as possible. Like the, the picture I showed at the beginning of the presentation, generally a facility, facility like that cannot be built for the type of money that we put into it. And that's, that's a bootstrapping mentality that I think is, is very difficult to carry out in clean tech and software, you know, the, the whole garage thing and, and buying a decent laptop works a lot better than when you're dealing with uh, approvals for pressure vessels and putting together engineered drawings for, for PNIDs and things like that. But we're extremely proud of where that's gone and, and really we'll find out over the next few months if that bet is, is paid off. But definitely to your, to your second question about financing in general, I think generally we found three avenues for funding. So one that we've been very fortunate with within the Canadian ecosystem is um, federal and provincial uh, funding. Um, and there is a lot of interest in carbon to value. And I think a lot of people look at carbon tech in particular or carbon to value initiatives as a way of not necessarily solving the climate change issue, but catalyzing uh, can be facilitated at a faster time scale. And, and really that's kind of where we see our, 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 our role in this bigger scheme. Um, and within that, I think, you know, even within the states, um, you know, there is positive movement and, and talk around that. Uh, the other two pieces are venture capital, which I think is definitely getting more and more active. I think Nick covered that very well at the beginning of this presentation. And lastly, I would say, and this is kind of... Suspenseful. Oh no, the best part. Okay, he's probably saying that pearl of wisdom right now. 
Okay, let's hold it there. We'll come back to why the poor minister. Sorry. We missed, oh. the, we missed the pearl of wisdom you were about to drop, Apoorv. Um, was that the third piece or the second? I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was a third. I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you to hold on that. Let's come sure. back to it in a second because I see Jen Wagner is just here from Carbon Cure. I'd love to bring her into the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Jen. Um, great to see you guys in the news again in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more insight on how things look from your perspective or any news uh, you want to share around some of the recent announcements. Sure. Thanks, Marcus. Hi, everybody. I've um, been really enjoying the conversation. Uh, it was on back to back panel, so I apologize for my previous background there. But um, yeah, I, I just uh, want to echo some of the comments um, Nicholas made around uh, accelerated scaling and Pat's comments around sort of business model innovation. Um, so, this couple of people have touched on the fact that there's been quite a few uh, climate pledges, offset purchases, and then new climate funds announced over the last few weeks, really. Um, and all of these are really important um, accelerators to scaling technologies like ours. So if you don't know what Carbon Cure does, we're a, a climate technology uh, repurposing CO2 to make concrete stronger and greener. And uh, we were the recipient uh, in, within the first tranche of Amazon's first uh, investments in their new fund, uh, co-led by Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, and we were also uh, recipients for both Stripe and Shopify's uh, first offset purchases. Um, so no question, those are wonderful levers to get us to move a little faster. Um, you know, capitalizing the company is one thing, but also uh, the beauty of the offset purchases is that we actually can share the funds, like to the point uh, Pat was making about business model innovation is we push those funds down the supply chain to our industry partners to incentivize them to actually use the technology more often. So adopted at more plants, maximize usage, because all of those things create more reductions. Um, so we sort of noodled on this for many months and tried to figure out a model that would uh, help us meet our goal, which is 500 megatons by 2030. And it, sort of putting that offset revenue as a bit of a carrot in front of them creates this beautiful flywheel effect where it in turn then creates even more reductions. Um, so I think that's sort of the, what, what we're seeing at least today uh, in the last few weeks with all of the attention in the space is that um, there are solutions available today, you know, dollars in equals carbon out. Uh, and that's, that's, a bit, that's available today. So we're, we're really excited about, uh, about what's to come. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, I'm seeing a bunch of questions. Uh, thank you again really for joining us. I really appreciate you can take time to step in here. I see a handful of questions related to carbon removal and direct air capture. Before we get to those, let's pause. Caden, please put up poll number three because I think it'll sort of put a, put a nice wrapper on some of the conversations we've had just recently. So uh, if you're, I see a lot of people are still with us, stretch your legs. By that, I mean, <laughs> read this question uh, and give us uh, your best answer. Do this week's corporate and government commitments to get to net zero make you more or less enthusiastic about circular carbon issues? And as I mentioned, once we get some responses in, we will move to a handful of other audience questions that are grouped around carbon removal uh, and direct air capture. Uh, and then we've actually got a few great questions after that I'd love to get to. Okay, survey says, uh, more optimistic or about the same is almost everyone. Um, and one person said less optimistic, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. But on balance, about two thirds of people more optimistic. Okay. Let me get to some of these carbon removal direct air capture questions. Um, I'll take moderator's privilege. I am in the XPRIZE office. I'll just point out uh, both Apurv and Jen are leading companies that are in the finals of the NRG COSIA Carbon XPRIZE. That means they are demonstrating industrial pilots now, either in Wyoming or in Calgary. And the COVID curveball for us this year means we have a couple of companies that are based in Asia. They have no chance of getting to North America to test this year. So they're trying to set up demonstrations there. So please check out those companies, follow what they're doing because they're doing it now. And we hope to announce the winners of that prize in the springtime. There's a, it's a $20 million total prize and there's 15 of that million still on the line. We also have ambitions to raise several tens of millions for a carbon removal prize. And so I see several people from the XPRIZE community asking questions. And I know a lot of people are uh, focused on that topic, whether it's direct air capture or other means. David has been a great supporter and advisor on this as well. So, we have interest in this as well, but clearly there's interest in the broader community. Um, 
So from Greg Marinak, co-founder of XPRIZE, what is the current state of the art of carbon removal in terms of cost per ton? Another question I'll add here is, does the humanitarian impact and sustainable development goals impact make carbon dioxide removal more attractive and get more attention from investors? So what's the state of the art in cost per ton? And do SDGs uh, get the attention of investors from a perspective of, uh, well, making an investment decision? Uh, David, I know you have thoughts on these, but I'm inviting anyone in the panel to comment. So um, if you want me to start off, uh, you know, in terms of uh, direct art capture, the, the stated numbers from uh, Climeworks, one of the three companies that did it a couple of years ago is about $600 a ton. Uh, the carbon engineering's uh, target numbers uh, for their next plant, they're putting up the million ton plant they're doing with Oxy is getting, you know, towards $100 a ton. And long term, uh, you know, that's similar, I think, to what uh, Climeworks is hoping to do. And then Global Thermostat, who I'm a senior advisor to, is looking to get towards $100 per ton or well under over the next several years. So I think um, also just to give a, you know, a sense of the likelihood of that, if you look at solar, solar uh, decreased by 250x multiple over, you know, 20 or 30 years, uh, wind 25x. So to get from $600 to less than $100 a ton, I think is not only doable, but actually very likely based on how experience curves work and learning by doing. So, um, you know, today we don't have yet an announced plant with, with great numbers yet, but I think they're, they're coming sometime over the next 12, 24, 36 months. So I think it's gonna be an exciting time for the area. Thank you. I'll add editorially that there are other carbon removal pathways that claim uh, or can demonstrate lower prices, but I'll also quote Jen Wagner in a comment she wrote in the chat at some point, which is, let's not forget to focus on permanence. And so I think we see that the, the spectrum between some types of removal can really have long duration, others don't. Um, others are, are sort of a slightly different play. Um, any comments on the question? This is a really interesting one. Do, does connecting SDGs to carbon removal or the SDG impact of carbon removal mean anything to investors? That's a really interesting one. Anyone wanna comment on that? Do people see this as a plus and react to it or not quite? I can just maybe put in a quick comment from some of the interactions we've had with corporations, um, especially in the last year and a half. Uh, about two years ago, we participated in the Lafarge Wholesome Accelerator in, in France. And, and we've been able to engage with a few European entities since then. And we've generally found them to bring up the SDGs in, in pretty much every conversation we have. Uh, we've seen that to be the norm more so in Europe than we have in North America. But having said that, I think, uh, at least from, from our experience, uh, we're still seeing their Still seeing. As a listed company, of course, yes. Like on the switch. Sorry, Apoor, if we're having some network difficulty, I think, with you. I apologize for that. Oh, no um, worries. But I think Rio backed you up by saying, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, because uh, the ESG investment is very critical for listed company. So, mm -hmm. uh, SGD, ESG, yeah, I think I'll, we are talking about it in the same context. So, of course. So, I guess the, the path there would be investors who are holders in public companies or private companies exerting pressure as investors through boards. It is. Uh, that's sort of the ESG pathway you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, we are short on time, but I want to get to a couple. There are really a lot of great questions here. Um, one is from Chris Gassman. Are there best in class monitoring and verification standards that consumers should look at in order to trust the carbon tech play is having the real impact claimed and bought? This one could go a while, so I'll ask you to keep your answers short. Any best in class verification standards? Emerging. Yes. Um, in the Carbon X Prize, we had to basically create our own standard for CCU because we couldn't find one that was adaptable in, back in 2015. And since then, several have started to come on the market. So we can sort of relate to that concept of emerging. Uh, and let me just make a shout out. If, if folks in the audience are in that space about uh, sort of verification of these types of technologies, we'd love to hear from you because 
uh, I think the need is still there and the opportunity is growing. Okay, there are a couple more that are uh, along the themes of how do I get involved in this space? So here is one. Uh, for those of us who aren't founders or investors, where are the career opportunities in the circular carbon space? Um, well, I, just if I can answer that, you know, I think more broadly, um, you know, the interesting thing about the whole area is that today the revenues are close to zero or very modest in the whole area and the forecast of a trillion of dollars. So by definition, this is going to become an enormous area, both from a capital standpoint and revenue standpoint and, you know, job standpoint. So I would say anyone who's looking at that, that's probably a good instinct to look at it. Um, I, I think, you know, I'd encourage people to look at what are the uh, the industry groups you can join, either online or, you know, other things like that, get to know the community. The community isn't that large. And I would just say, you know, uh, the community is very welcoming because there are so few people doing it. So even though this is supposed to be a multi-trillion dollar industry over time, you know, there's, you, can, you can fit about everybody in one very large conference room. So, you know, if you're interested, please join. I'm sure there'd be, a, you know, some great opportunities over time. So there's one tiny little corner of this world that is going to be a great market opportunity, employment opportunity. It, it's an odd one. In New York City, we've passed something called Local Law 97 that puts every building over 25,000 square feet on a carbon emissions budget. If you, and the first part of the law will kick in by 2024, so everyone is supposed to be scrambling now to get off of fossil fuels. Let's see if that happens. Once the penalties kick in, I think it's about uh, $260 per metric ton is a penalty. So that will drive the market and it will drive a market for carbon trading between buildings. It will drive a market obviously for uh, energy efficiency retrofits, but that's not the issue. The issue is what people will be paying to exceed their carbon emissions budget. And that will create jobs in carbon trading in carbon capture coming out of smokestacks of buildings, all kinds of interesting things. And then what's gonna be done with that carbon that is captured. So there will be a little mini market in New York that's not so many. Uh, estimates have been, I think, over 200,000 jobs and over 2 billion spent to make these buildings meet their carbon targets. Yes, okay, really interesting. Uh Trading between buildings is something I've never considered. I'm glad you raised that. Pretty interesting, yeah. especially in a place like New York. We are almost at our time. I'm gonna read out one final question, not ask you to answer, but I think it's a good one and uh, some for everyone to think about. And then we'll flash up a, a quick poll question before we thank our panelists. Um, the question is, what are the types of skill sets that people need to advance progress? And are there particular gaps in human resources? Again, I don't think we have time to speak to it, but I think it really speaks to the idea of how do we actually get the resources and energy to grow this space? And I'm glad uh, Stephen Kaufman for raising this because human resources will certainly be part of that. Okay, in our closing few seconds, Caden, I'd love for you to put up the last question. Uh, it's a softball for the audience. Are you more optimistic or less optimistic about the future of circular carbon after participating in this discussion? Uh, while you contemplate that question, I'd just love to take a moment to say thank you so much for Apoorv, uh, Rio, Pat, and David for giving us your time and insights today. We always appreciate your thoughts, but especially joining us today with our audience. Uh, audience members, thank you for joining and sticking with us. We've got great participation right through to the end. And finally, let me give a huge thank you to the whole team putting this on at XPRIZE, at Pure Energy, and all the other organizations that have come together to support this, um, especially the XPRIZE team, technical team, Kaden, Nikki, Mike, James, who are hosting. Uh, our web interface today. Now, I don't think I caught the results of that poll. Uh, maybe I missed it. There it is. More optimistic, about the same, a few people less optimistic. Listen, with that, let's close the session. Happy Climate Week, everyone. Thank you for your participation today. Um, check out circularcarbon.org, check out Carbon to Value program, check out what Mitsubishi, what David is doing, what Apurva is doing. There's a lot of excitement in the space and we look forward to joining you again either at future Climate Week events or next year at this summit. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Well done.